Okay, so good morning, everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you for asking me to give a talk and be part of this course that I find really nice, interesting, well-organized, useful, I guess, for most of you. So actually, I have, uh, I'm going to move a little bit away from what the title of my talk promises, at least for the first part. Um, because I have decided to take you in a journey through the use of microscopy in immunology in general. I mean, I won't be able to cover everything, obviously. But so most of the things I'm going to tell you, especially in the beginning, it's not something that I do. I have been able to collaborate with some people to take some of these nice in vivo movies that I'm going to show you. But it's just to make you aware of what is being done in big labs around the world and how uh, microscopy has contributed to improve our understanding of uh, the immune system and how uh, the immune system works by visualizing it. And so you have to keep in mind the immune system, it's really complex, is made up with several cell types that needs to communicate. And cells of the immune system move a lot around the body so they migrate, they interact, they send and exchange messages. And up to the, I would say, 90s, all we knew about the functioning of, of the immune system came from cells put in a dish, just to see that they would proliferate or not, or by my mouse studies where you would inject a cell into the mouse and then look and follow proliferation. But nobody really knew what was going on among those cells to uh, support the reaction and the initiation of the immune response. This is a nice picture of a lymph node, just to show you the... Okay, and, and so just, just a reminder that, of course, these reactions occur in complex and highly structured and organized tissues. So immune communications takes place in organized tissues. And that's why it is really important to look at what's going on in uh, tissues. So uh, as I uh, anticipated, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the dynamics of immune cell interactions in vivo. And then we will go down to the cellular, subcellular, and molecular level to tell you a little bit about how microscopy has been used to study events of communication at the single uh, cell level. So uh, what is uh, two-photon or multi-photon microscopy? I'm not going to be able to be very technical. You can perhaps ask Paolo or some other people if, they wanna, if you want to know exactly about the principles. But all I want you to, uh, to know is that by the use of two photons that are, used, that are simultaneously delivered on the samples, you can penetrate deep in tissue with very low uh, toxicity. And you can, therefore, in a single plane, take images and record movies within a tissue. And when this technique was uh, first developed, <coughs> oh, actually, well, no. And I just uh, want to uh, bring your attention to the fact that you can ask several different questions related to immune cell reaction, to immune cell dynamics in vivo, in many different contexts, such as infection, cancer, transplantation, and understanding the basics of the immune uh, responses in general. And if we zoom now on a lymph node, and again, I bring your attention to the complexity of the different areas and the different uh, domains of a lymph node, people through uh, two photon microscopy have been able to ask questions about the germinal center reaction, about who is first capturing an antigen once it comes in the body, the B cell uh, dynamics, the T and B cell health dynamics, the initiation of the immune response, I will mostly tell you about this uh, aspect at the, at the, at the very in the, in the early stages of an immune response, how T cell proliferation occurs, and how uh, T cells exit the lymph node once they get activated. So if we jump back in 2002, this was the first report when people finally succeeded to record T lymphocytes in the lymph node. And this was done uh, by transferring labeled T cells into a mouse, so T cells labeled with a fluorescent probe, and taking the lymph node out of the mouse. So this was done on explanted lymph nodes at the beginning. 
And so there were a lot of concerns and tricks to keep the lymph node at the right temperature and mimic the flux. And I mean, many, many different uh, adjustments of the technique until people finally succeeded to see uh, cells uh, moving. And I know a little bit of that because when I was doing my postdoc in Paris, people were trying to record the cells in the lymph node. And it was really super complicated to get the right conditions to see the cells moving. So uh, as you will see, this pioneer movie shows something very simple. So we only follow one cell type. So we have green lymphocytes. And they are, as you will see, in four different situations. So we have no antigen here. And the cells move really fast, as you can easily appreciate. Instead, if you uh, have, if you immunize the animal, one day after immunization, you do see that cells begin to uh, form clusters, and they don't move very much anymore. And these type of dynamics were called with different names, stable clusters versus swarming. And if you wait a little bit longer at day five, the cells begin to move again and begin to divide. So you have some dim cells that are divided T cells. So this was kind of great at the time because it was the first time that T cell priming and proliferation was recorded in vivo. So if we now uh, jump. Uh, well, I don't have the dates here, but this is 2008. So you see technology has improved. Now people at this point in 2008, and probably before it was started in 2005 or six, were able to record these movies on a living mouse. So the lymph node was just surgically exposed. So all the flow, blood flow, lymph flow was kept. The mouse was alive. So the relevance of taking these movies was much, much higher, as you can easily guess. And you can um, follow and track many cell types at the same time. So in the movies that I'm going to show you, for instance, you also label the antigen-presenting cell, which is red here. And then you transfer two different T cells, blue and green. And I'm not going to go into the details, but you can ask different questions using cells that have different specificities, for instance. You have an antigen-presenting cell that present the two different antigens. And you can begin to ask subtle questions about who is landing first on the antigen-presenting cells, how long am I staying on an antigen-presenting cell. And again, it's an example similar to the one I showed you before. This is a very early time point. The T cells in blue and green just move around a lot. But if you wait a little bit longer, you see that clusters are formed. So you see blue T cells tightly interacting with red antigen presenting cells. You see a little bit less the green T cells stopping on ADC. And this is uh, back what I was mentioning. In this specific paper, people used T cells with two different specificity to ask which one was landing first, how long the contacts would last, and so on. So this is just a very simple uh, model to tell you the type of information that people were able to extract from these type of approaches. And for instance, what was clear is that at the very initial phase of an immune response, there is a phase called scanning of the antigen-presenting repertoire, whereby T cells move and touch and kiss and run many times on the antigen-presenting cells until they do find the right cognate interaction and stop and stay there for five, six hours in order to collect all the signals that are needed for a T cell to then say, OK, now I'm ready to get activated, and they detach at that point. And, uh, and there are many examples. I mean, there have been thousands of, thousands of nots, but hundreds of papers asking different questions on, on the initiation of the immune response. Uh, now I'm going to move to another example, which is uh, easy, whose importance is easy to, to understand for, for everybody, even in different fields. So we all know that cytotoxic T cells can kill virally infected cells and can kill nascent tumors. And again, this knowledge comes from uh, ex vivo experiments and from mouse studies whereby you know that if you have a tumor that expresses an antigen and you transfer T 
cells specific for the tumor specific antigen, the tumor can be eliminated and rejected. But how does that occur in vivo? So uh, this is uh, a paper from 2008 from the group of Philippe Bousseau in Pasteur, who did probably some of the most elegant studies in, in, in two photon microscopy, always using smart tricks to address his questions. And in here, you just see the model presented. So you have a tumor that is called, e this is all mouse study, of course. This is a tumor that is implanted into the mouse and it expresses a specific antigen, which is OVA. This is a control tumor. All you have to look at is that if you don't transfer any T cells, the tumor grow, grows here. If you transfer naive, non-activated T cells, the tumor grows as well. But when you adoptively transfer into the mouse, <coughs> activated T cells specific for the antigen expressed by the tumor, you get a nice tumor uh, rejection. And this is shown on uh, slices taken from the tissue. You have your antigen-specific tumor in yellow, your non-antigen-specific in blue, and you see that five days after transfer, the antigen, uh, the, the tumor expressing the antigen has been uh, eliminated. So how to take records of this elimination in vivo? So what they have done, they have inserted a reporter, a FRET-based probe to monitor apoptosis of tumor cells uh, in vivo. And this is based on FRET, CFP, and YFP, linked by a caspase 3 cleavable uh, domain. So when the, cell under, when the cells enter apoptosis, you express caspase 3, you cleave this linker, and you disrupt FRET. So it's all based on the ratio between these two uh, emission. When the cells are alive, you will get mostly a red signal. When the cells are dying, you will turn into green. These are just some controls at ex vivo to make sure that the system uh, works. So cells that have a control linker that it's cleave caspase insensitive, you illuminate with UVB to induce apoptosis. You see that cells fade but not color change, whereas in the right linker, you get firing of the green signal. And you can express, by measuring the ratio, what is called the apoptosis uh, index. So let's, let's move to the, to the in vivo situation now. And you can look first at a high uh, magnification, and then zooming in, that T cells, CTLs in here are <coughs> labeled in red, and you do see contacts where the tumor cell becomes green when it is in contact with a CTL. And if you uh, zoom on single contacts, you really can see that a CTL can turn a tumor cell into green. So that means you're really able to record the event of apoptosis and killing in vivo. So of course, all this type of approaches requires then taking the information out from these movies. And this is just one of the figures of the paper. There are many others. But you can, for instance, express your apoptotic index as a function of the number of CTLs that have been in contact with your tumor cells. You can follow the fate of each cancer cell, whether it <coughs> will become apoptotic or not, as a function of having or not being in contact with the CTL. And you can try to understand how long it takes for, an for a cancer cell to get killed. And for instance, just to make it simple, the message from this paper is that indeed tumor elimination is operated via direct killing of tumor cells because for instance it wasn't even clear that it's only CTL that kills the tumor cell. One of the hypotheses was that you may engage other uh, effector, immu uh, other immune effector to operate the killing and instead 
this paper kind of show that indeed there is a direct contact and a direct killing by the CTL that can eliminate the cancer cell. So now uh, another interesting example. We are now very recent. So again, you will see that images have improved, technology has improved. It's a very dense paper that I'm going to go through just showing a couple of nice movies. It's a different questions that the authors were asking here. So trying to visualize the killing of the <laughs> virus infected cells in this case. So the virus is an MCMV that expresses a red fluorescent protein and it's Upon infection, nicely visible, you can see many nicely, nicely, <laughs> very clearly the infected cells in the lymph node few hours upon infection. And you can also see that the virus tends to localize in a very peripheral area of, uh, of the lymph node. So in here, the question behind was trying to understand how many contacts and how many CTLs are needed to kill a virus infected cell. Um, the system is a little bit um, more complex that I just showed you in the first picture. So it's a little bit forced. This recombinant virus expresses red fluorescent protein and it expresses a specific antigen, which is OVA, so that you can have specific T cells for the killing. And in addition, it has been deleted of a protein that is responsible of downregulation of MHC class 1. So this virus normally would evade immune recognition by downregulating MHC class 1. To force the system and being able to record the killing, they have like eliminated this protein. So this virus is not <coughs> able to hide from the immune system. In the paper, there are all the examples when the virus is instead proficient, all these type of contacts are very rare, so it's really difficult to take a movie of the killing event. So this is kind of pushed, but it allowed to see that actually when you have many CTLs, this time the CTLs are in green, virus infected cells are red, when you have many CTLs that attack one, uh, infected cell, you can really have elimination of the infected cell. And uh, I have, did not insert it in the PPT because <coughs> it was really, really big. The movie is really long. And I think it's just nice to see the end. There are many examples. And two different uh, zoom. Oh, I see. No, no, see that. No, no, niente. Stupida. Non la posso far vedere. Come faccio a far vedere il mio schermo? Scusate. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so what was seen in the still images is now uh, seen dynamically here, and you have Here a nice example of a virus infected cells being attacked by many CTLs and you see that by the end of the movie there is really little left of the uh, infected cell. Again, then many parameters can be extracted by this uh, type of analysis, like the speed of different cytotoxic T cells over time before they contact a viral infected cell, where you have a slowdown in the velocity <coughs> and then a rescue in speed upon a certain time. Then you can express the uh, killing depending on the number of contacts that they have experienced. 
and try to understand how long it takes for destruction and, and disruption of the virus infected cells to occur. And what people have learned from this type of analysis is that accumulation of multiple contacts over time is required for killing an infected cell, meaning that it's not sufficient to have just one contact and the cell dies like that. But there is cooperation among different CDLs that together kill one single virally infected cell. And one extra uh, thing that was interesting uh, for me to uh, share with you in this paper is that you can also have functional imaging of, of, of what happens in a tissue. For instance, the peop they were interested in understanding whether calcium fluxes are occurring in the virus infected cells during the killing process because perforin, which is released by cytotoxic granules, induces holes in the membrane, and this causes calcium fluxes. So how can we look at these calcium fluxes in vivo? So they have inserted a reporter in the virus, which is an ultra-sensitive calcium sensor that allows to track calcium fluxes in, in, in vivo. And so in, uh, in the absence of cytotoxic T cells, there are just some um, very brief very brief uh, firing of the calcium response. This time it is in, uh, in green that you follow calcium fluxes. And your viral infected cells are red. And you do see some transient lightening of the calcium signal. But when instead you have CDLs around, and this time it will be This time it will be um, blue. Okay, blue for CTLs, red for uh, infected cells, and always green for the calcium fluxes. And you see that when a CDL is in contact with, uh, has been in contact with virus infected cells, then the cell undergoes sustained and prolonged and very extensive calcium fluxes. And so again, then you extract uh, all the information you need by analyzing these movies. And it's what I just saw, it's depicted in here. You have transient and multiple short calcium fluxes that occur spontaneously. But when you have a cytotoxic T cells around, that forms a contact, then your calcium fluxes become sustained and last for much uh, longer. And uh, here is just what I want to, I just want to sum up uh, a relatively simple take home message to uh, just bring your attention to the fact that in vivo imaging in tissues has been really important to change our, our way of, of understanding and, and, and conceiving functioning in the immune system. There are several different examples of how this can be applied. I just decided to pick some of those that seem to me the most interesting applications. But there is a lot that is being done these days to study infections in the brain, in the liver, in the skin, studying what's going on during bone homeostasis in bone marrow, in lymph nodes, of course, that was the pioneer because it's easier to get access to lymph nodes in timeless development. And with the uh, evolution of several type of probes, it's really nice and interesting now to look at how molecules, for instance, soluble mediators are diffused during an immune response and, and so on and so forth. So now uh, let's go uh, back to single cell level and molecular level. And again, of course, I stay focused on the immune response. And instead, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what has been done isolating cells from the tissue. Because of course, through photon microscopy is great, but you <coughs> can't get the same resolution that you can on a slide and looking at isolated cells. And I will show you how microscopy has evolved over the years and has helped us to understand many principles about immune cells activation activation of uh, immune receptors, a communication about cells in the immune system. 
just a very brief uh, reminder of this essential step <coughs> of the immune response. So we have an antigen-presenting cell that patrols the environment and collect many signals in the forms of pathogen, dying cells, process them, and present them in the form of antigenic peptides on MH cyclus 1 and MH cyclus 2. And then the job of this antigen-presenting cell is to activate T cells. And the T cells is then the um, arm that it's needed to clear pathogens and for tumor immune surveillance. So the job of the antigen-presenting cells is to deliver the right signal to the T cell to induce its um, proliferation and to induce effective functions. All starts with a physical interaction between the two cells. And this physical interaction is really the platform where these signals <coughs> are transferred from the antigen-presenting cell to the T cell. And back in 2003, people discovered that during the interaction, molecules at the interface are not distributed randomly, but rather segregate into a very specially organized structure that at the time was a name, the immune synapse, because of its analogy with the neuronal synapse. And as you see, this is a Z stack. It's really like what was called the bull eye structure, whereby signaling molecules were gathered at the center, whereas adhesion molecules were pushed uh, in the periphery. And this was just the starting point of several papers and a lot of work trying to understand how these molecules are dragged outside or in the center, what is the functional meaning of segregating different signaling receptors. And this has been uh, achieved by several different systems because it's not very easy to study always the two cells, so people try to mimic and reproduce the antigen-presenting cells using cell-free system, for instance, using beads coated with different ligands, using lipid B layer, where you can insert different molecules that you want to use to interrogate molecule by molecule what it induces in your T cell, or cover slips coated again with different ligands. And so our vision evolved thanks to these tricks and these new tools. And for instance, what was discovered is that actually at the very early time points upon contact with an antigen-presenting cell's cluster of signaling molecules, in here you see the CD3, which is a key signaling molecules associated to the T cell receptor. And ZAP17 is one of the transducer of the signaling cascade are indeed beginning to cluster and form patches in the periphery of the cell, and only upon a certain time they all converge into the center. So at the time it was actually proposed that this structure is not needed for signaling, as initially thought, but it's actually a way to shut the signal off. Because within this central structure, the receptor is internalized and cleared to uh, stop the signal. And then, I mean, again, technology evolved, and now we are able to study this receptor clustering at the nanoscale by the use of PAL and STORM, and our understanding gets more and more sophisticated. We now know that there are many nanoclusters that form that are really dynamic, and they are competent uh, for signaling. And just all I want to show you to, to, to end up this part Thanks to mic microscopy and evolving technology, we move to this very naive view of the immune synapse to complex situations like this one, where you can really track many molecules, define domains over time, and really understand in the details how different signaling molecules distribute, support the signal, and all that is related to positioning and time, special temporal organization of these signaling platforms. And it's really interesting that this is not just for the sake of understanding what's going on, but I was really surprised to see that many of these studies are now being picked by people that are studying adoptive T cell therapy and immunotherapy, because you probably are aware that now uh, creating super fit T cells and infusing them back in patients, it's one of the great promises 
in immunotherapy for chronic infections and cancer. And it has turned out really important to go back to all this basic knowledge to understand how exactly my, for instance, recombinant TCR needs to be made, the length of different domains, the accompanying receptor to make sure that once I infuse back my T cell in a patient, it will be really effective, it will be long lasting and it will accomplish uh, its function. So I think it's really a nice example of how basic science going really tough into a single biological question through the use of very sophisticated techniques can then link back to uh, clinical uh, applications. And, and now I'm going to move to my things. <laughs> Just to end up, I have 10 more minutes. This is a very old movie, but it's always so nice to look at. That was taken in Curie in 2000 and, well, I can't even say that long time ago, 2000 and something, where you can see that when an antigen presenting cell and a T cell interact, there's really a lot that has been uh, done by the dendritic cells to catch and, and engulf the T cell in a very uh, tight hug. So this platform, again, is the platform where MHC peptide complexes, co-stimulatory molecule, and inflammatory cytokines. So all the information that has been gathered by these antigen-presenting cells is transmitted to uh, the T cell. And uh, from all I told you up to now, people mostly over the years got interested in how the T cell responds to these signals. And this is obvious because, I mean, the T cell is doing the job. So most of the studies on the synapse focused on understanding how subcellular domains become reorganized within immunological synapses, what type of receptors cluster and redistribute at the interface, what is the underlying motors, cytoskeletal motors that allows this redistribution to take place. But we were actually interested in trying to take a look at what's going on on the antigen presenting side of the immune synapse. And this is what I have been doing for, for uh, the last uh, years. So we know that MHC class 2 molecules become redistributed, even in, in this case our antigen presenting cell is a dendritic cell, which are the most potent antigen presenting cells in our body. So antigen uh, bound to MHC molecules gets redistributed. There were some um, scattered reports suggesting that also cytoskeletal molecules becomes redistributed and that vesicular trafficking is somehow probably modified, but nobody really knew much about it. So what we decided to, uh, to do some, some time ago was to begin and look at whether the dendritic cells become polarized within an immune synapse. And I just want to mention for, for I mean, the, the purposes of, of then doing the real experiments, the most difficult problem that we faced, we're still facing, is that we work with primary cells. They're very difficult to transfect. So all you can do in microscopy is a bit limited. I mean, you don't have a big cell, very stable, where you can insert whatever gene you want. So it has been a real struggle in trying to get some overexpression of fluorescent molecules. I mean, now, again, things have evolved also in that sense. At the time, it was really tough. And uh, we could do things, for instance, by, by getting uh, mice, reporter mice that already expressed fluorescent genes, because having a gene in the dendritic cells was really uh, difficult. So, but going back to the data, so what we found is that indeed when a dendritic cell interacts with a T cell, it's microtuber organizing center. This is a situation where there is no antigen, whereas here there is antigen. The microtuber organizing center gets repolarized, and this is nicely seen, better seen in here, where you have a center in GFP expressing dendritic cells, where you see your MTOC really just opposed to the interacting T cell. And then, yeah, this is the example. We, we have been able, with many struggles, to express CDC42 EGFP in these cells or uh, a dominant negative form of CDC42 because we wanted to understand what is this repositioning mediated by. So CDC42 is one of the raw GTPases that was shown 
to be important for repolarizing <coughs> microtubules in T cells. And we could see that indeed CDC42 gets enriched at the synapse, and that when you knock it down, repolarization of the microtubule organizing center is, uh, is lost. Uh, so the next question was, <coughs> OK, so a dendritic cell polarizes during the interaction. What, what is that uh, used for? And an obvious thought based on, on what had been shown in T-cell was that perhaps that was useful to deliver soluble signals straight into the place where they are needed, straight on the face of the T-cell. So we began to label and interleukin-12. So interleukin-12, just very briefly, it's a super important cytokine that is produced by disease and then instructs T cells to be fit and to undergo extensive proliferation. So you not, don't only deliver antigenic signal, but you also come with chemokines and cytokines that help the T cells to proliferate. And we actually found that where you have the MTOC, you also have your IL-12, that it's brought very near the interface with the T cell. And if you look at here, you have this amount of IL-12, which is still in the Golgi. But then you see post-Golgi vesicles that are really underneath the T cell membrane. And, and, and so oh, just to, to, to make a <coughs> simple model out of these studies, we have uh, discovered that also the endritic cells polarize the MTOC. This is mediated by CDC42. And it's likely a mechanism that improves the transmission of signals from the antigen-presenting cell to, uh, to the T cell. And this, well, it's useful to induce <coughs> T cell activation. And, and looking at these uh, vesicles of IL-12, we got interested in a further question. So how, how is this cytokines trafficked within the cell? And, and, and I was really surprised by realizing that there was really little known about the trafficking pathways of these cytokines. Actually, there is something that it's known in macrophages and in T cells, but in dendritic cells, much less, and especially very little about IL-12 itself, which is still a key cytokine for the uh, priming of the immune response. And very briefly, this cartoon is just to, uh, to remind you that once you have uh, cytokines being produced in the ER and then traffic into the Golgi and in the trans-Golgi, then the proteins, newly nascent proteins, are sorted for exit from, 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 from the, from the trans-Golgi. And they can follow different routes. They can travel through microvesicles and get directly through constitutive secretion, being secreted through constitutive secretion. Or they can intersect the endocytic pathway and merge with recycling endosomes, and in some cases, with late endosomes. And in addition, immune cells have some specialized organelles, like granules, where they store different soluble mediators that are secreted via regulated secretion via secretory lysosomes. So it seems to be really cell and context dependent. So it is indeed complex. And it is not easy to make just a simple bet on how a cytokine would exit the cell. So we got kind of interested in the cell biological aspect of secretion in dendritic cells at the synapse. And I'm going to go quickly through the data. We used to track the pathway of secretion of, of this cytokine, and in this case was IL-12. We made use of uh, the tracking of trafficking proteins. So all trafficking steps, as you know, are mediated by membrane trafficking protein of the SNARE and RAB families that specify each trafficking step and specify the destiny of a given molecule and of a given organelle in its journey through the cell. And in particular, in SNARE are required for membrane-membrane fusion and to help overcoming the energetically difficult step of membrane fusion. And why I got interested in SNARE is because people before us had mapped trafficking pathways by using snare proteins. And in the case of macrophages, it was discovered that TNF, which is a major cytokine expressed by macrophages, tra uh, travels, exit the Golgi via a complex of snares ma made up of syntaxin 6, VDI1B, then syntaxin 7, travels to recycling endosomes marked by MAM3, and exit the cells at the plasma membrane through a complex made up by syntaxin 4 is NAP23. Uh, and these are just other examples to tell you that in many 
uh, context, the different context, the pathway followed for secretion were identified by studying this different snare that were helping these trafficking steps to occur. So we decided to undertake the same approach. And so we've begun to look at the distribution of different uh, trafficking snares in our cells by simply doing co-localization experiments. And what we discovered is that, um, and then we have proven by, by many other ways, is that P40, which is one of the two subunits of IL-12, and it's labeled in red, by analyzing several cells and quantifying the co-localization index of, of single dots, we realize that the strongest association of IL-12 in post-Golgi vesicles is found with VAMP7. So, uh, I mean, IL-12 is found in vesicles decorated by VAMP7. This is just a similar thing. We're just looking at a different uh, subunit of IL-12. And, um, yeah, it's not written here, but VAMP7, it's specifically labeling late endocytic vesicles. And then we just try to track whether VAMP7 gets redistributed at the synapse, and this was the case. So in here we worked with antibodies against VAMP7, but then we also managed to overexpress VAMP7 GFP and see that indeed it gets repolarized. So we quantified over time the extent of redistribution of the immunological synapse. The co-distribution of IL-12 and VAMP7 in the area of interaction, which is shown in here. So when we looked specifically at the synaptic area, most of our IL-12 is found in association with VAMP7 and not with VAMP3 that labels instead recycling endosomes. So we've taken some movies of uh, VAMP7 labeled with uh, RFP, and you can nicely see that indeed uh, during formation of an immune synapse, VAMP7 redistributes near the interaction area. And this is just depicted here. You have actually a first T cell contact, then the protein redistributes there, but then it goes away and up and down. But it tends to be often localized at the synaptic area. And this was uh, a movie that cost us really <laughs> a lot of struggle. And we made it with, with a demo of size that brought <laughs> a live, I mean, these are the things that you have to remember, though. During Christmas, we convinced the guy to leave the video microscope <laughs> in here, because we didn't have one at the time. And we succeeded to make the movie that was asked by the reviewer. So that was really fun. Well, fun, kind of. And in here, we, uh, it's not super convincing, but it's the best we could get. In here, we instead follow P35, which is a subunit of IL-12 marked with GFP. The T cell is in here. So we could see vesicles docking in the area of, uh, of the uh, synaptic uh, region. And then, uh, being in the end immunologist, we went back to the mouse model to prove that indeed VAMP7 is important for secretion. Mm -hmm. And so we isolated mm, dendritic cells from the bone marrow of wild type or VAMP7 knockout mice, and we could show that indeed secretion is, uh, is uh, reduced. There are just some mm, further controls. And this is just a uh, further essay to demonstrate that indeed VAMP7 is needed for synaptic secretion because in this experiment we just measure in 10 minutes, in a very brief time, the amount of IL-12 that is extruded in the cytosol in the presence of the antigen or in the absence of the antigen. And this specific synaptic secretion is totally abrogated when VAMP7 is not there. And this is again immunology things. So indeed, VAMP7 knockout cells do not induce this cell proliferation as nicely as, as wild type cells. And so this led us to, to the following model. So we do have indeed uh, discovered that IL-12 exit the cell using vesicles that are late endosomes, lysosomal vesicles, these vesicles get recruited at the synaptic sites and that this protein, this snare protein, it's in need needed for efficient uh, T cell priming. 
And this is just a few of the people, I, I, I don't have all of them, but Julia was doing most of the VAMP7 work, and past members did the MTOC uh, work, and some of our um, funding agency, and, and thank you for your attention.